is Sammy and we are here at Patrick Recording Studios and I am honored to be here with a very special guest for our I Do Music podcast. What's going on, Kawan KP Prather? What's going on, Sammy? What's going on, KP? So you, you've done a lot of work here at Patchwork Yeah. over I, the years. You've, you've been in the game for over 25 years now. Yeah, I feel like um, me and Patchwork started our professional careers together. Absolutely. Um, there, there are so many people that you've developed relationships with, but first I want to talk about who you are, what you do exactly, because some people may not know. They should. Yeah, most people shouldn't, actually. What? If I do it well, they shouldn't know I did anything. Absolutely, because you're, you're, you're the man behind a lot of the great... Um, artists that we know, some of my favorites, actually, uh, Pink. She's one of my favorite artists of all times, actually. She's one of my favorite people of all times. Absolutely. I wish I, I could meet her one day, but I know that you, just speaking of that Pink, you've worked with uh, T.I., you've worked with Outkast, who's worked here. Um, could you tell me about, I guess, your start and what you consider yourself as uh, in the music industry? Overall, I consider myself a DJ. Okay. But that has opened up doors in the sense of the executive side and the writing side and the producing. Um, I've kind of done every job in the music industry at I least noticed. once. Like, I've directed videos. I've, like, I've, I'm have like i creative, and it's my space to create. You know, so it's like the, I do a and I've done that for the better part of 20 years. Yeah, and speaking of A&R, so you actually you were DJing for um, a well known group within the Dungeon Family, mm-hmm. uh, Parental Advisory, and so we were moderately known. Well, I mean, if you're from Atlanta, <laughs> if you're from Atlanta oh. in particular, I'm from Atlanta, so I I knew about the Dungeon Family growing up, Goody Mob, every every, I think entity, especially uh, with organized noise coming back, mm-hmm. I think and now a lot of my generation is being hip to what was going on then because wow. we were so young. I didn't. I'm not gonna sit here and say, "Oh yeah, I was listening to Bruno." No, but still, you you were their mm-hmm. DJ, mm-hmm. correct? Yeah. And um, through that, you started touring. Um, you the like you said, the doors of the music industry opened up for you. Could you describe the first experience um, where you started doing A and R? Okay, so as a member of PA, we were signed to Pebbles, who was at the time married to L.A. Reid. Mm -hmm. Um, and L.A. Reid had LaFace Records. I was introduced to Pebbles by T-Boz of TLC, who was like my big sister. Okay. So she had us come down to um, an audition for the video Baby, 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 and she she was like, just bring the group down. Pebbles is going to be here. Mm -hmm. Y'all come bring y'all stuff and set up, and I'll make sure y'all get an audition. Nice. So when I got there, Pebbles... Instead of that, she was like, "Okay, if you want to audition, that's cool, but you got to be in the video for like that'll be the the payment." You, okay. You be in the video for me. I will listen to y'all group. Got gotcha. you. Cool. So I sold myself for the first time for the team. <laughs> um, but during that time, we were recording at her house. Okay. Which was her and L.A. Reid's house, and they had this million and a half dollar studio in their basement, and we were just some kids out there recording. And because I was a DJ, L.A. I think talked to me about records. Mm-hmm. You know, just to get my perspective. And I think the first time I did some actual work was we were in the studio, and he was. they were at the end of making the, t- the Tony Braxton first album. Nice. And he came and was like, yo, I want you to listen to something. And I was like, all right, bet. I didn't know, I didn't know why I didn't understand that I didn't get he it. He wanted your opinion. Right. I didn't get that at the time. Right. Because, you know, that's L.A. Reid. Exactly. So he played me these records and asked me what I thought. I told him my opinion. He was like, all right, that, that makes sense. All right, cool. All right. You know what you you might you might want to consider you might being be you might want to consider getting on this other side right because he basically was saying that I um because of how critical I am mm-hmm. and you know and detail oriented in that in music he was like you'd have a great space over here helping people because since you don't want to be a front guy or an artist it could like you could be like a Bill Russell coach type person who understands the game from playing it but understands you know, the necessity and understands how to motivate and move people. Nice. And so that was, how, that, that was my first A&R. That, so L.A. Reid mm-hmm. basically kind of put you on game in terms of A&R. Pebbles and L.A. Reid. Pe- Pebbles and L.A. Reid. Nice. Yeah, because she put the light on me. I, I love it. I love that. And um, let's rewind a little bit in terms of when you discovered, because you talked about uh, having this, I guess, uh, you, you have a, a mind or an ear for music, obviously, as a DJ, as someone who is discovering and breaking artists, essentially as an A&R. 
what moment in your life do you feel like it you just knew that music the music industry was for you um if you could take us back a little bit the moment i don't know if i've had a or an moment. experience maybe that um told you like hey this is what i want to do for the rest of my life i think after being in the group for a while and mm-hmm. we had toured and and over that touring process i learned when i learned i just met people right like everybody we toured with somebody in that band or in that crew i was cool with whether it be the roots whether it be when we were at the time you know the fujis and tribe called quest like they were all kind of they were still new they were big to mm-hmm. us but they were still new and we all just got to know each other and in that i started finding out what other people did like i found out the q-tip produced i didn't know that as a fan i didn't right, know right. that at the time it wasn't like a i didn't i didn't read credits for that right and when I found out he really was producing, he wanted to produce other stuff, I would call L.A. and like, yo, I just met Q-Tip. You know, y'all should hook up. And gotcha. this is, you know, again, this is before before I was actually working for him. So, you know, this was kind of those seeding things. So I think the one time um, L.A. had a group called A Few Good Men mm-hmm. on Sound to the Face. And they had a record called Have I, Have I Ever. And it was produced by like Daryl Simmons and Babyface. But it was a ballad. Okay. And the group at the time wasn't necessarily taking off, but it had great songs. Mm-hmm. So L.A. asked me, like, yo, what do you think of this? I was like, hey, man, you know what? Let me try some." And because I'm a DJ and because I'm from Atlanta, we had these things called Edward J. Tapes, okay. where you would take a ballad and flip it with a bass record under it and mm-hmm. mix the two together. Mm-hmm. So I was like, oh, man, let me try something. So I, I had met Van, who was thrilled to play her from the 69 Boys while we were out. Wow. And I was like, yo, you want to remix this record? And it'll be like a, you know, a bass record, but it'll be... Still that ballad. Still that ballad. Yeah. And L.A. let me do it, and when it came back, it worked. Wow. It worked for them. The 69 boys are on it, and they were hot at the time. Mm-hmm. And just seeing how I could... Being in a position like A&R, you, you get to put people together. You get to... You kind of connect the plug the almost. Yeah. So it was one of those things where it's like you... I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I know I wanted to expose different people to different music and different types of music. I like kind of mashing things up. So I, I obviously um, researched a bit more in terms of who who you are and what. So I did a little digging, and I noticed that the uh, you were hustling. You've always been a hustler, I would assume around 12 or 13 at the Atlanta airport. Could you tell us what you were doing exactly and how you were able to meet LL Cool J? Because that's what I was going for. Oh. <laughs> well, no, see, but I didn't, again, that was just like a moment. Okay. I see yeah. what you're doing, though. That was yeah. awesome. That was awesome. Um, So around 12, me and my cousins, we used to go to the airport and the little carts that push the, the luggage, Yeah, people would leave them wherever they left them, wherever they finished. But back then, you could take those those oh, when you take the them carts back, you back, would get, you get a in? quarter. It. it would just pop out of the slot. So our whole thing was we're going to go, we're going to run through the airport all day and just collect. Like, you know, every day we make some like $20 a piece oh, wow. just off quarters. And and at the time they had a video game arcade in the airport. Uh-huh. So we would, we, would, we would trap out all day at the airport. Then we would spend that money. We would go spend about $5 at the, um, at the arcade. So one day I was doing that and I was playing this game, Kung Fu. I was just whatever, willy-nilly, and this dude got a, p- walked up and was like, yo, shorty, can I play this game with you? Because it was a two-player. Uh-huh. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> and, but I looked up, and he had this chain on. It was like in Chinese letters, it's a little gold chain that said LL Cool J. And I was just, as a kid, I'm like, yo, what's that mean? Mm-hmm. And he was like, ladies love Cool J. And I was like, all right. <laughs> so he was like, yeah, you know, he's like, sure, you don't know me? I was like, no, nah. can't put my finger. Right he was like, "You ever heard the song um, My Radio?" No, I need a beat, and I was like, mm, I, "I I need a beat." He was like, "Yeah, that's me," and I was oh, like, wow. "Oh." So at that moment, I was like, "Oh shit, this is like a real person." Right. And this dude just playing video games with me. Like at the time, there was a commercial back then. It was a Mean Joe Green. He was this big football player, mm-hmm. and this kid walked up to him, and he was all nice to him, and it blew the kid's mind. That's what happened to me. Nice. Like LL was like, "Yo, kid, you know." You cool. And I had a Walkman. I had a like a Radio Shack Walkman. And he was like, yo, you want to sell that Walkman? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, um, how much you sell it for? I bought it for maybe like 10 bucks. I was like, 30. <laughs> he was like, bet. And he, and he gave and he gave me 30 bucks. And he was like, yo, shorty, that was, that was a cool little move you pulled. He was like, I know this ain't $30 worth of Walkman. 
<laughs> and so I was like, whatever. He was like, so you know, you need to come meet my people. Mm -hmm. And back then it wasn't TSA, so you can just walk through the airport anywhere. Wow. So he took me back to the terminal where his crew was waiting to go to the next city, and it was the Beastie Boys. It was, what? you know, now I know it was Leo Cohen. Wow. It was DJ Hurricane. It was it was all these people who yeah. I would Eventually a month or two, a, well, actually a month or two later, know who they were and be real fans nice. of. Nice. Because the Beastie Boys weren't popping yet. Gotcha. Okay. Well, yeah, they were. Um, but it was just, but it was one of those things. I was like, wow. So y'all get to travel the world rapping, this. and he's a DJ. Bet. All right, cool. And you know, and I just talked to them, and mm -hmm. they told me what it was. And from then, I was like, okay, I, I knew there was an opportunity in it. Right. Right. In this thing that I like so much, because in my Walkman, I had a tape. It was just, you know, some. You know, it was just some rap music that I recorded off the radio. Mm -hmm. So I knew I cared enough to, to put in that work to sit by the radio, you know, and really pause, like trying to catch it on beat, exactly. trying to make these things sound professional. And it was it was just one of those things that it made sense with what my passion was at the time. So you've, you've definitely uh, created or developed a lot of relationships with people within the industry um, from Outkast, like I said, TI. You've produced a lot of records. Mm -hmm. um, for these people as well. Can you talk about how you, I mean, I'm sure it just all kind of happened <laughs> together. Like, you know, you hear it all the time, like DJs become producers or producers become DJs, right? But um, getting to that point, like you've most recently gotten a Grammy from All Right with that record with Kendrick, which is amazing. Congrats to you Appreciate on that. Appreciate it, thank you. Um, but just, you know, in 25 years, you've, you've done so much. Can you talk about working with some of the great greats here um, in Atlanta, being, uh, in Atlanta native yourself, going to Tri Cities, like mm -hmm. I went to Maze myself, so I'm I like, got kicked out of Maze. Oh, I'm sorry. No problem. What'd fine. you get kicked out of Maze for? Never you mind. Talk about I know it. It. Come on. <laughs> Pee Wee the long way. What? I'm a school guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, the T I well, relationship literally started from this building. Is that where you met him? Well, that's where we all kinda met. Um the group I was in parental advisory, we were recording here. Mm -hmm. And Jason Jeter, who was T I's manager at the time, was working here, you know, doing nights at, at Patchwork, right? Mm -hmm. Just hustling, figuring it out. And he he met Reese, one of the guys in my group. Okay. And was like, yo, I got an artist. Reese heard him. I came, Reese called me and was like, yo, you need to come hear this dude. So mm -hmm. I came down, met him. You know, I just liked him. He was just a cool dude. Yeah. So I was like, well, you know, shit, rap. He was like, if you rap, rap. So he was like, all right, whatever. <laughs> I was like, matter of fact, can you do something on this record? Mm -hmm. and it was a record we were working on at the time for our album, and he got on it and lit it up, and I was like, oh, bet, let's do it then. <laughs> and that weekend, I was like, look, we're going to the Source Awards because that was the year that um, Dungeon Family, we were going to do Watch for the Hook. Nice. And I was like, you know, you should just come out here with us and see what, you know, see, see how if this is for you. Right. So, you know, I took him out there, and it was the, it was probably, by, it was by mistake, but it worked. And put, throwing him into... The, you know, into the pool with the big fish and watching him swim so, and watching him be comfortable in that pool right. was like one of those things that made me understand how to even look at when I'm looking at artists and trying to pick who I'm going to work with. Mm -hmm. Like I have to now think about, okay, I know who my friends are. My mm -hmm. friends are like superstars and culture shifters and all kind of, you know, superheroic people. Mm -hmm. So I can't, I have to make sure that if I'm bringing someone into it, they either have the potential to be or are that. And in and, and, and saying that, what skills or what attributes are you looking for when you're looking at an artist? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about who you're working with now, what, mm -hmm. you're, what you have going on right now, but what, for those listening, what exactly are you looking for? What should artists be prepared for in that? I mean, it, it's how you, how you take lumps. It's okay. like, you know, it's the same way that you look at, you know, again, I, I'm from Atlanta. I come from a family of people who were in, you know, businesses that were, you know, there were consequences and there were, like, real thoughts that you had to choose the people that you bring into your circle. Absolutely. So I've, I've taken that same thought process in it. Like, you don't want, you're only as strong as your weakest link, right? Mm -hmm. So if if I bring someone in, they have to be super talented because the people around me are super talented. Exactly. They also have to be willing to compete because there's, competitive super talented people around all the time trying to get a spot Absolutely. trying to get a look because you know in this business there's only but so much time on radio there's only but so much time in in the day it's only but so it's too much on Twitter so it's right. like you gotta be good enough 
to, to push through that. Like you got to get through that 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 first couple of stages fast, and you got to be able to make it through it with the same vigor on the other side. Because right. some people get beat up going through that process, and they can't make it. So you look for people who who have stamina and who have like that will, mm-hmm. and you know that's kind of been the, not even kind of that's that's been, when it's successful that's been the common, like you look at Pink Pink, Pink has gone through a lot as a human being, mm-hmm. so to be standing on the other side and still able to give herself to people listening, mm-hmm. and and understand why that's important. Like it's selfless. It's it's a very selfless thing to be able to to really be a superstar. Like you gotta really kind of take yourself out of it sometimes because right. you, it's a sacrifice. So you look at people who are willing to sacrifice and how much they're willing to sacrifice for the dream that they say is they theirs. want. Right. So uh, speaking of your energy and keeping people in your space, you talked a little bit about that. Um, you have a team. Mm-hmm. I know we have some some of your team here, your publicist, as well as um, your assistant slash co-manager at this point, Regina. Uh, How how have they affected or played a role in the success of your career? Well, Regina has been in my life since the day I started at LaFace. Wow. Um, And and it's the same thing. It's like when I met her, her spirit was so good. Like her energy was so like inviting and calming. And I'm, I can be, you know, harsh at times or at least, you know, blunt. And I always, I knew that I was going to need a balance. A person who, when, when people aren't fucking with me, they'll like still get on the phone for me. Right. And Regina has been that person. It's like, she, she's the person who guides me through, you know, my, my attitudinal shit. Like, because as much as I'm an executive, from a creative space, I can get into, you know, a mood. A yeah, mood. We all, we yeah. all have those issues, those struggles. I'm, mm. I'm the same way. Yeah. It's fine, but you definitely need that. Yeah. that and, balance. and as a creative, you're, you're really sensitive. Mm-hmm. So you, you pick up on so much that sometimes you just need space. So sometimes I take it, but she keeps me accountable. For, I, th- for I think things. that that that's important though. Just having good energy, good team, good space around you. Mm. I'm sure over the years you may have faced a challenge, or you may not have faced any oh, challenges no. with people around you. No, it's challenges all the time, and that's the thing. You you look at the people who are consistent in your life, and and honestly, you look at the people who are consistent in the room when things are going well. Mm-hmm. And those are the people you want to maintain in that room. Like, and and sometimes I think that's where artists and you know groups, pe- people in general. We get to a place where we recognize the, the part that we play in success sometimes way bigger than than it actually is. And it sometimes either eclipses or takes away credit from the other people who help. And I'm just I'm really big on trying to maintain that people are credited for what they do. Right. And, you know, because now I understand that that credit is the thing that keeps them going and gets them the next opportunity, mm-hmm. and you know, I'm um, I'm just really big on on energy and, and good energy and giving energy. Absolutely. So we uh, talked about Kendrick Lamar and that record for All Right. You getting your Grammy nomination? That's such I won, an am- actually we won. What, excuse me, winning <laughs> I'm the sorry, Grammy. I'm just saying. Like, I didn't mean to say I, nomination. I've been in this a long time, and I got one. I want. I yeah, wanted it. So. No, correct me, please. Okay. I appreciate that. Yes, you got that. Nom- I mean, excuse me, I that get Grammy for uh, Kendrick Lamar's record. All right, uh, but you've also just done a lot of work. Like you have just done a lot. You did Omarion's Icebox, which brings me back to like Scream Tour. Mm-hmm. You've done like. Mm-hmm. Uh, you worked with Yellow Wolf, like just a lot of uh, diverse projects. You worked with a lot of different people um, producing in that production realm. So could you tell me one of your favorite either experiences or your favorite bodies of work that you've done to date? From a production standpoint? Yes, from a production standpoint. Honestly, and I'm just going to say my favorite, I don't know if it's the best or not, it's just my favorite, um, Green Light by John Legend. I love from We produ- played that in band. Yeah. And, and it was like our dance song. It was a great, it was a great song. Okay, so ironically, so that song we actually did, we did work here at Patchwork. Oh, nice. You know, we did the horns here. Andre laid his verse here. Nice. You know, so one time for Patchwork. One time. Um, on matter of fact, on New Year's Eve, so they opened up. I remember that much. They they opened up space. Oh, we open as long as you want to work. You know yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but no, that's one of my favorite ones because it came at such a weird time in my life and career because mm-hmm. um, I was coming off of, again, I, I've had a, I've had a very or fairly successful career. And at the time of Greenlight, I had just got fired from Sony. Oh. But it was after signing John Legend. It was after, you know, 
Omari, and it, it was a lot of cool you, stuff. You happening. made moves to, during that period. Yeah, mm-hmm. I had just signed Yellow Wolf. Nice. But Rick Rubin, who was one of my heroes, all time producer heroes, came in and he cleaned house. He brought in his team. I got fired. One time for Sony though, because this is the thing: get your paperwork together because mm-hmm. contracts matter. It's because I had just did a new contract, so it was awesome. People in business will know that and understand it. Um, but coming off of that, my my ego was. Oh, it was like no, nah, it was tore. It was like it was curled up in fetal position in the corner at that point. Like and John called me and was like, "Yo, I know you're not there no more, but I still want you to do my project." Nice. And this was I was like, "Oh shit, cool, bet." And when I went in, this he had this song Greenlight. He had written it, um, and I can't and I I feel horrible not being able to say dude's name, um, but he had did it with a producer from London, um, in London, and. It, it was a different track. It was just totally a different feeling. Mm-hmm. And John was like, I like this song, but no, and nobody really was fucking with it. And I was like, oh, it's because it sounds like porno music. <laughs> because it, it was just the key. It was a writing demo. It wasn't necessarily supposed to right. be the song, the song yet. Yeah. And I think John understood that. But when you play stuff, when you play demos or in progress pieces with people, they don't look past the thing they like. They just, the thing that they hate is the thing they think they about. They stick with, right. So anyway, he was like, but people aren't feeling it. So I was like, oh, let me try something. I went back to my base bag, and, <laughs> and you know I brought the, the the session back to Atlanta. I had just met this guy Malay, um, uh, he, at the time just a guy he owned a studio in New York, mm-hmm. um, producer, but he hadn't had credits. I was supposed to meet with him the day I got fired, yeah. so I met with him. I called him the day I got fired and said, "Yo, man, I'm no longer up here, but I don't know if you still want to meet or not." But you know. I can't help you at Sony. Right. And he was like, no, 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 come over. I really wanted to meet you anyway. Yeah, just you. So I was like, oh, bet, cool. So I went and met with him, depressed as shit. But he played me a bunch of music that was amazing. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yo, man, you're really talented. But I think because you have so much access to to um, sorry, to sorry, a catalog of just what you can play, you overdo it sometimes. Mm-hmm. And and it was, like, it was like one of those moments. And he was like, man, well, why don't we just do some stuff together? And I was like, well, we can do that, but I'm moving to Atlanta next week. I'm so going back home. What are you going to do? <laughs> and he was like, man, well, I mean, I could sell this. And he was in this studio. He's like, I could sell this. And I was like, well, you come down, you can stay at my house, and right. we'll just work. And literally, I moved, I bought a house. The week after he came down, we built the studio in my basement and started working. So it happened to happen within a month of this, this time, right? So that a month in, John called me mm-hmm. with that. So I was like, oh, bet. So we took it back. We did this, we did, like, we went through about two or three different kind of versions of what it was. Mm-hmm. But when it got to that place, I was like, oh, shit, this is it. It feels like a fam you song. It and surely I was, was. And, and I was, we, <laughs> we played that song. I was like, I loved it. I never got tired of it. It was a great dance song, great feel. Uh, it just, it worked. And, and it was musical. And enough based to play. on that, that beat, I was like, let's, well, let's put live horns on it that, right. to, to make sure it's a band song. Mm-hmm. We came in, Patchwork, knocked it out. Um... Man, Horns Unlimited, I think Horns Unlimited played. You know, they their Outcasts horn section as well. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like it was such a good feeling. And then I sent it to Dre, and it was like, "Yo, man, I I know you ain't really doing that right now, but I just want you to check this out." And he called me back. Like I sent it to him the day after Christmas. He hit me back on the thirtieth of December, and was like, "I I think I got something for that that record. Um, can you book time?" Curtis, can I get time tomorrow? <laughs> I know it's New Year's Eve. I know people are trying to do shit. He said, yep. Dre came in. I came by, said, what's up? He said, hey, I'm going to knock it out. I went, matter of fact, I think I went, I, matter of fact, I know for a fact, I went out on a date, went and had something <laughs> to eat, and he called me was like, I'm finished. Wow. I came back, and legit, it was everything. That it was one, two, three, green light. And I was like, he wasn't even supposed to do that. He was like, it was a space. I figured I'd just try to fill it. You only got to keep it. Right. And I was but like, wow. But I was like, so it was one of those moments from, from a producer standpoint. So many things happened in that song that it it's absolutely the thing that got me out of my, my little slump mm-hmm. emotionally and, yeah. and creatively, too, though. Right. It made me realize, okay, it's not just about me working at a label. It's about me just being creative in a space. I think that um, what I've connected with everything that we've talked about so far is just that you're really good at um, connecting the dots and, and maintaining relationships. I think, you know, things happen. You are going to leave. You, you've you worked with Interscope. You've worked with, you created your own label, mm-hmm, Ghetto Vision. Ghetto Vision. Um, so you've been able to kind of take away from 
uh, all of your experiences and move forward. That's important, I think, in a creative space in general. Uh, mm-hmm. When do you think that uh, you you've you've been in game for over twenty five years? Do you think that uh, or have you ever even worked any other job outside of music? Before, before before it got professional and I was able to sustain, no, I, I did a bunch you of jobs. You did odd jobs? They weren't necessarily odd. Well, they actually are odd. I was a bail bondsman. Um, I worked at an ice cream shop. Um, yeah, it was, it was odd. Yeah, I worked in the airport at this ice cream shop. Nice. Mm. And I, I was going to say, if it weren't for music, what could you imagine yourself doing? Or could you imagine doing anything else? Yeah, I wanted to make you think just a little bit, you know. Nothing too serious. <laughs> What's funny is, and this sounds crazy, but I like washing. I like washing cars. I like washing my car. Like I really enjoy that shit. Like, Interesting. So uh, they, I got my car a, out there. If you I'm listen, talking. like for the for the right number, I will do it. <laughs> like if I got the time, like this is the thing. Like I'm not I'm not scared of working, man. I, I and and some things like I actually said I was gonna open up a car wash at some point because you should. Yeah, I mean, but you know, I gotta do some shit first, but. <laughs> But that's the thing. It's like I I don't know. I don't you don't know. know. It just would you know think. Yeah, there's no point in me thinking about that type of shit. <laughs> so what what are you? <laughs> let's just bring it back to 2017. Uh, what are we focusing on today? You do a lot of things. You're today, a DJ, producer. You you you're A and R. What are you doing right now today? Um, right now I'm talking to you. Um, but I'm focused on everything I'm doing, which is developing talent, which is always there, and trying to push new generation and new things into the culture um i i refound myself in djing again i think that's the that's the thing it's probably i looked at my instagram the other day and realized that's actually what my life is that's my thought probably for the last year Mm -hmm. you know outside of my family and and you know work which i don't probably put on instagram as much because i'm like in sessions i think it's weird like, I think it's weird when people are in meetings, like, hold up. You <laughs> know, take a split. <laughs> I'm like, nothing happened yet. <laughs> like, but anyway, um, yeah, but DJing, man, like, I've been having fun because I get to, I get to now, for, for my own reasons, now go research and find new music. Right. And now I'm falling back in love and finding new music that I really love. Connect with. I, I like that. And you, you've actually, you know, done a lot um, with re- revisiting this, this craft of yours. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm d- good at that shit, though. Like. No, I mean, I hear you. <laughs> and we we going to hear you in a few, too. So I, I definitely believe that. You you DJed uh, for Wally Sparks' uh, party, birthday, birthday party, party yeah. that was before Serato. I've heard so much about that. Uh, also, the Green Heart Holiday Gala yeah. for CeeLo. Um, I see you're going to be at the Atlanta Jazz Festival. So you got some stuff lined up, for sure. Mm-hmm. What... what um, what else, or where, where do you want to take it with your DJ? And are you looking for certain types of events? What do you want to do with this? I, I want to play music for people who want to hear adult music. Um, like, I recently, like, a couple weeks ago, just did Knife Wonder's birthday party. Nice. And those things, for some reason, mean a lot to me because, for one, I respect Knife so much, and he's he's a dope DJ in his right. Mm-hmm. Um, but just to be... I, w- I want to take the DJing into a place where... We actually, as as DJs who aren't strictly EDM, are doing produced shows where it's actually entertaining. Like, mm-hmm. why, even at Wally's spot, I told him, I'm like, what I loved about it is he has these projectors and they're playing mood stuff on the screens while you're DJing. It give it helps. It's an atmosphere. You're creating that yeah. environment for the people. I like that. So I wanna, I wanna, I wanna at least be one of the people who pushes that agenda in creating an experience in the party as opposed to you just getting hollered at all night by somebody turning off music every three beats you know because i respect that a lot thank you, thank you. we appreciate <laughs> you there are people that still appreciate an experience when going out so i do i do respect that a lot um and i look forward to hopefully attending some events soon mm-hmm. uh, but other than that you are the head of music over at i am other i am that's amazing i'm all for pharrell and the the Me movement too. i am other um and what you're probably doing over there so what i'm doing mostly is learning okay. honestly like um I mean, obviously, I do the part that I do. I, you know, we have artists. We have Cap G, who is signed at I Am Other. Like, yes, I, I signed yes. him while I was at Atlantic and brought him over to I Am Other because I understood, I, I knew for a fact that Pharrell would be a, a great influence on him. Absolutely. You know, I think that when I heard, so Cap G, let's talk about mm-hmm. Cap G a little yes. bit first. He's he's uh, from Atlanta. He actually went College to Tri-Cities Park. with you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have some friends that, you know, he's he's 
a part of our uh, generation and moving that culture forward. I like his music a lot. But I thought when I heard he was with Pharrell, I'm like, that's so interesting. That's amazing for dude. Like, mm -hmm. really amazing. He's he's not your average rapper to me. Yeah, he's, not, he's not an average person. Like, he's, mm -hmm. he's a, 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 I want to say Cap's 22, 23 now. Mm -hmm. Um, 23 year old Mexican American, born in Grady Hospital in Atlanta, raised in College Park projects, but his family is, you know, it's 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 so much culture in that house of his 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 Mexican culture, that he's grown to be a kind of like an anomaly in a way, mm -hmm. because for one, growing up probably as the only Mexican family in College Park projects at the time, the shit that he had to go through. <laughs> You know that builds a character, that builds a thick skin, and it and it kind of builds you to be able to be in front of this many people, right? Um, and not get so but hurt about every comment, especially in the social this media world, space. Exactly. Like you know, I, the way I've seen him handle himself through that is probably the most amazing thing. But putting him with Pharrell give gives him, for one, that access to you know one of your heroes, but someone who is genuinely wanting to help inform and push you know the artist to be better and to be at their best and to be you know great in their space and Pharrell's his music has traveled the world so you can't argue that exactly you know and the thing is you know the younger generation based on the amount of access feels like it's easier and it's not it's legitimately the same amount of work it's mm -hmm. just more tools and that, that actually brings me to a, a great question um, in terms of social media, mm -hmm. uh, what what elements of hip hop today uh, in social media? Like, how do you feel you can connect the two? Like, what are there positives to this? I'm sure there are a lot of things that we may not necessarily love about social media, but what are the positives in ex uh, pushing your career through social media? I mean, if you're dope, social media is the most awesome thing in the world because you can film it, talk about it, write it, say it. And it's in your own words. It's it's showing what it is, um, so it gets to, you know, it gets to people faster, or at least it has the ability to. Mm -hmm. If it's dope, it travels. Like you know, things go things viral. Go viral right. They go viral for a couple of reasons. I I think. Okay. You know, either they're silly as shit, mm -hmm. they're super funny, um, they're super horrible, or they're super great. Right. Right. So it's like. You just got to pick what thing you want to be, but you got to be super at it. Like, you can't just be... You can't just be average. Yeah, like, nobody nobody knows about regular head. They know super head. <laughs> I can't. I can't. Just saying. <laughs> that is true. That's a great point, KP. Thank you for pointing that be out. Be your best. <laughs> be, be your great. best at whatever it is that you do. <laughs> well, <laughs> so what, what are some elements, speaking of things that we want to take from uh, hip-hop, what are some elements that you wish... Um, artists today would take away from things that you were doing, and you know, speaking of like DJing, you know, it's a lot of it's a lot of DJs that's just like pushing buttons. It's <laughs> a lot of you know. So, what are some elements that you wish um, today that a younger generation would? I think take from? putting effort in. Like, I think because you can put every thought out into the world, it doesn't mean every thought is worth that space. You know, I know people with hundreds of thousands to millions of, of, of followers on their social media. And to put a brain fart up sometimes, is I, I feel like that's a little, you know, it's, just, it's irresponsible in a way. But yeah. but at the same time, it's, it's such a fine line. that The hip-hop part of it is easy. Be original. Don't bite. Matter of fact, have your own style. Like mm -hmm. So it's like social media, you don't have to do everything that everybody does. Mm -hmm. It's like you in order to create a fan base, a following, or even trust, right, you got to be consistent. Absolutely. And they're, they're, I think people use their social media for every part of their their being. Mm -hmm. and some shit is for the telephone. Some Sometimes you should call somebody. You got to get on the phone. Yeah, sometimes you should speak to people. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and if you see somebody doing something, you don't always have to just deal with it on social media. I think that's the, the biggest thing. It's like social media th makes people feel like that's the only place to be social. Mm. But they leave out the media part, which means it, everybody can get to it. That's deep. That's real. That's very real. That's why I'm really excited for you to DJ these events, giving us an experience. People can go out and touch somebody and say, hey, you know, let's dance together. Like, people don't do that anymore. Oh, no. And, and I think that's what, okay, so I can say that about the DJing. Like, that's been the consistent, um, I guess, feedback that I get is people dance. 
and they like it. Like, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? They enjoy themselves. They don't... It, like, at first, I was getting weirded out because there wasn't activity on social media. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd leave the party, and I'm like, damn, nobody said nothing. But then somebody would show me footage, and it's like, oh, that shit was lit. They were just too engulfed in the But they in were the actually moment. in it. And mm-hmm. I was like, okay, cool. So I got to, even me, I had to, to take a step back, like, stop worrying about, you know, as an artist, don't worry about the social media part. Like, let the actual people, let the actual thing do its thing. Because what were we doing before? We were just talking to each other like, yeah. hey, that party was lit, that KP DJ, that KP did great. Like, that's what people people talk. Mm-hmm. So that, that influence will come regardless. And that's um, how the music spread. Like, we, right. you know, again, I, I did a panel for the Coalition DJs the other night, mm-hmm. and, the, and it was on longevity. <laughs> and when you realize that, people aren't getting good information and they're not being mentored in a way that's building them to be successful over long periods of time because no one's telling them like you have to make an experience like i got a homeboy pretty can that if you meet him you know him he's forever in your head whether you love or hate whatever you, whatever he said he leaves an impression nice. and and those are the things that artists sometimes um they they don't they try to fit in so much and not be pointed out that they become background and normal. Just like everybody else. Yeah. Mm. So uh, my question, or my next few questions, are more so for those interested in being where you are today. Um, I know it takes a lot of hard work. We've already discussed that. But I mean, it's hard work, but it's also a, just a lot of random uh, a random opportunities and noticing them. And, and yeah, mm. like, and actually taking advantage of them. Yeah, because it's like I, I don't know... I, I'm not gonna act like I'm over here begrudging, like, oh my God, this is so hard. I'm out here digging ditches. No, yeah. I'm, I'm. It's hard. It's hard to um, sometimes maintain the the amount of work or the amount of time that it takes. Because mm-hmm. that's really what it is. It's like giving the art or the music or whatever it is that you love the time it it needs to be developed properly. The hardest part is is the time because I got like a real life and I got like a real yeah careers. like balancing your personal life and you have children. I have children. I have a girlfriend. I like I have a bunch of stuff going on that 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 feeds my creativity though. Mm-hmm. Like everything around me is a part of it. Like you know I have to be careful. Like if I DJ, I can't DJ after argument. Like shit come out I'm be. flexing on my ex bitch. It's like I ain't no telling. Like it's you know it's 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 a real <laughs> thing. It's like protecting all of that is a is a yeah is a thing. Totally that's understand. the hardest part i understand so well i was gonna ask you um in terms of you know there i'm sorry i'm sure the youth were listening we want to know is is college necessary for um getting or becoming an AR or getting into that industry in that space i think college is necessary if if you need people to make you read <laughs> but the information is there like the information is there I'm a I'm a uh, I'm a proponent of college because I think it's the place that you learn. If you haven't already figured out what it is you want to do, mm-hmm. it's another opportunity to get exposed to things. So I think that's the that's where I think it's its best. Yeah, thing. I agree. But I mean, I, 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 I didn't think go, so I can't I can't, you can't say speak on that, you know necessarily. I, well, I went I, to I, a bunch of colleges, but I just <laughs> never attended a class. Got you. I think college. Uh, my my take on this college is necessary for the experience. More so, like if you like, I needed to get out of the city personally. Mm-hmm. I went to DC and went to college. I needed that experience, but I, I agree, you can get out there and get some information. It's Google. Google's there. Yeah, it's books there. So, uh, what do you think the before we get into you? Because we know we're gonna go ahead and let you spin for us. Oh, I'm excited for that. Uh, I'm surprised. Like I didn't bring all my shit. Like what? Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so, what, the last thing, any bit of advice that you could give to someone, like I said, who's interested, not necessarily being in your shoes, but interested in doing any of the things that you have done over the course of your career? You got to find a thing that you care about and figure out how to make that a part of what it is you want to do. Mm. And, you know, in the industry, there's so many different, there's so many different routes you can take. You have to start at a place of at least a destination, because mm-hmm. um, I, I meet a lot of people say, "Yo, man, I just want to get on. Like, I'll do anything." I'm like, "Man, you gonna get, <laughs> you gonna get, <laughs> well, man, it's gonna be bad for you," <laughs> because the anything part is is not as good as it sounds. It's like somebody will drag you. Yeah. And if you don't have a a, a a destination, you don't ever have that. You can't make that decision on is this 
helpful to get to where I'm going. Right. So if you're just like willing to go anywhere, you tend to end up just, just somewhere. Going, yeah. Or randomly somewhere, or even yeah. nowhere at some times, I guess. Just having a purpose, finding your purpose. Yeah. I agree. You started off as a DJ, mm-hmm. right? We talked about that. And then now you found yourself right back to where it all started, mm-hmm. which is interesting. But how do you think being an A&R, I think you t- touched on this a little bit, being an A&R uh, or an executive and being in these roles at Interscope and uh, uh, working with L.A. Reid and all of these people, how has that helped you today and uh, kickstarting that career again? Oh, I mean, honestly, I think, uh, like anything, relationships are, are everything. Um, luckily, because in my a and or just in, in my time in this business, it's been, I've tried to build my, my career off of it being dope. Like, whatever it is at the foundation of it, it has to be dope. Mm-hmm. So the relationships I have are with dope people. Right. You know, so the situations I end up in are dope situations. And it's almost like my past, I've always wanted to be great. I've I always wanted to be great at something. Like, I remember watching the Grammys and seeing Michael Jackson cradling all them fucking awards and thinking, yo, I don't know how, but I, I want to I wanna get that kind of um, reward back for whatever it is I do well. Mm-hmm. But I want to do it as well as I need to to get that, though. And... My relationships, you know, when I called people and when I started calling people saying I was, you know, I was DJing again, like some people knew it because people who've known me from the beginning, like my crew, the Dungeon Family stuff, they all know that, okay, well, we know how KP is as a person. We know him as a DJ. We know how if he's ready, he's not going to say it if he's not for real ready to do it. So when I finally was ready to come out and doing it, I had practiced. I had really put my time in. I went back and started researching records and eras of music that when I was an executive, I didn't necessarily have to be involved in. Right. Like, there's a, you know, I call it, um, that 2001 to 2006 period of, like, or the, I say the Travis Porter, that space, I was living in New York. Uh, So so, there are places. That was prime time for me right there. I bet. So, but no, I found that that's a prime time for a lot lot of people. But but I know the records, but I just didn't have them because they weren't in my face every day. Right. So I had to really go back and and go through the internet, go through iTunes, go through blogs, go through. I had to really do research, research again yeah. to to make sure that if I showed up at a party, I wasn't that dude. Hey, you got uh, this nigga got number. Oh shit, you know because you didn't want to be that guy. Nah, I mean because I don't like that guy. You want to be prepared. I want to be prepared. I want I want to make sure that the experience I have the tools necessary to mm-hmm. make the experience what it needs to be when I leave. That's real. And you know. and that way you're able, you're prepared for any sort of atmosphere because I think that's the most important thing about being a DJ is that, you know, you may get there and they say this is a corporate, uh, you know, whatever event you're going to play a lot of, you know, slow jams to let people talk and network. And then you get in there, it's a full party mm-hmm. and it's nothing but us mm-hmm. in there trying to turn up. Yeah. So it's like you yeah. got to be ready for whatever. Yeah, I've seen people. Or it could be the opposite. Yeah, because the thing is preparing to me is just – knowing where everything is because you, you can't prepare for a party like I've yet to do it where I can like I, there's no way I can sit there and do and program a set right and, that, and that's what I was saying before though that DJs are doing that they're not really listening they're not really uh, paying attention to the vibes because you, you're pretty much a, the director of vibes at that point yeah you're in charge you're, in you're charge CEO of, of vibes I like that that might be a, a good title for you <laughs> no. moving for a CEO of vibes yeah um it, it, the the fact is that I'm I am happy that you're going back into this space and we will surely see you coming up. Soon. Is there anything that we can expect from you coming up oh, man, in terms of DJ? I'm the worst at this calendar thing. Um, I know that Super Bowl. Um, I'm doing something at the gathering spot, and someone just called me about something else that night. So I I can't. It's not booked yet. So let me not say that. But I know I'll be at the gathering spot on Super Bowl Sunday watching these Falcons rise up. All right, Falcons. Man, let's do it, y'all. Let's just pray on it. No, we we praying, but but y'all better do it. (laughs) Don't nobody go out. This ain't Miami. Don't don't go out there messing off. Please don't mess it up, man. Yeah, so that's 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 good. I'm I'm excited to hear more from you, and we're actually gonna take a listen to you. Uh, right now, giving us a live DJ set here at Patchwork Recording Studios. And this was KP the Great 
<laughs> and at Patchwork Recording Studios for the I Do Music podcast. Check it out. The dopest name in the world, I Do Music. Sonically Superior.